Okay, so again, the first thing you're going to do is to uh, um, open the apps anywhere on the, on the computers, lab computers, install Tortoise Git, Potty, and Visual Studio 2019, and then we're going to continue after that. Um, if you have all those things on your laptop, then you don't need to do it. You can just, just lose your laptop. Also, If you go to the notes repository, so you got to prepare your computer at home to do all these things. So you need to have Git installed. You need to have Tortoise Git installed on your computer. Um, and how do we do it? They're all over here. So I've written something over here that should be. Um, how to playlist. I think that's the one. OK. So you go to how to play this, it's, it, it, it gives you uh, all you need to do about like one by one um, how to do installation for Git, Tortoise Git installation, creating GitHub account, get the student developer package, basic Git commands using Tortoise Git, installing Visual Studio and all those stuff. So I put everything over there in order. One by one you do it on your computer and your computer is going to be ready to use at home. So you don't have to. If you want to come to the lab and do your stuff on your computer, you need to have those things. Uh, oh. oh, that's OK. Take a seat. All right. So again, um, open up uh, the computer over here and do that. Meanwhile, I'm going to actually put the stuff that are needed on a repository so you can actually get it. So we are, and I'm going to keep pausing the video when I'm not doing anything that is uh, record worthy, please, if so there was a spelling mistake. It's not tortoise, it's tortoise kit. OK, so tortoise kit, install tortoise kit, potty and visual studio. And uh, to do it on your computers at home, uh, go to the notes uh, repository. If you go to the readme file, it says videos how to play this. Click on that one at home. And you get all the YouTube videos needed to do the installations one by one on your computer and make your computer ready to um, work for OOP244. I suspect you already have 2019 on your computer because you've already taken IPC144. Um, and I added all these things to the IPC144 first la workshop too. So you should have all these things. But if you don't, then please do it. We need them. For those people, because uh, uh, we, I don't, I can't put enough stress on this. You need to master how to work with Visual Studio. Okay, um, I could have written stuff to work with Xcode on Mac, but I want, I don't want that. With Xcode, you can't do .NET development, and that's the next thing you need to do. And then you're gonna go to parallel processing, game development, and all those things. All those things happen on Visual Studio. You need to master this, because our subject is not that complicated. Learning Visual Studio while doing something that is not complicated is very simple. But if you just don't do this and go, go to game programming and at the same time want to learn how to work with Visual Studio, you're going to fall behind. Uh, if you have a Mac at home, Google how to do uh, boot camp, which means having two different operating systems on your computer, or install a virtual machine. You can use VMware for that. VMware for that. Um, and um, install a virtual machine, install Windows 10, and do all these good stuff that you want to do, OK? So um, uh, and if you are installing Windows 10, remember, only install the things you need for the subject. You don't want to make it heavy. A virtual machine is not a powerful machine. It uses part of your CPU to run. Because of that fact, you don't want to install games on it, OK? <laughs> Oh, I have Windows 10, so I'm going to install that thing and this thing. Don't do that. Just install the things you need for your subject, and it's going to run very smooth and nicely. All right, so that's that. And also now let me, let me continue. I have just committed and pushed up um, a, a source code into the repository for 01 January 10. So if you actually go to the notes and go up to the 
Okay, let me just refresh. You'll see it says 01 January 10, Section B, Modular Practice Workshop. If you click over here, this is last semester's workshop. Okay, so we're going to do that as a practice, and then I'm going to give you something new to do this, this semester. Okay? So um, our objective today is to learn how to work with Visual Studio, how to um, uh, de do debugging with it and understand how it works, st divide the program into pieces, make it modular, learn how to do safe header files. You have done all these things in IPC 144 without actually being taught of why you're doing this and that. So this one is going to actually tell you how to do it. So the very first thing you need to do is to get this uh, repository cloned on your computer, OK? Now, all those people who want to download zip files and stuff like that, I don't want you to do that. I want you to actually clone it. Now, what, the, what, what does it mean to actually clone a repository? And what is the difference between cloning and just downloading the zip file? If you see over here, you have different things. You can say opening desktop, download zip, use HTTPS or SSH. What the heck these things are, I'm going to explain it to you right now. First, I have to tell you what is Git. Am I recording? Yes. Git is a version control system. And what the devil is a version control system? Version control system is essentially um, having your code developed with Big Brother always watching. <laughs> Which means as you are doing your code and you are doing your changes to the code, Git is overviewing the changes you are making and keeping track of it. Every single change that you do to your code, anything that you add to your code, any modifications to do, that you do to your code, as soon as you save it into the repository, Git writes it down. OK, this added were changed. These were the things. So all the stuff going to go into Git. What happens is that, say, two weeks from now, you do something and you screw everything up and say, oops, this is not right. I, have, I better go back to what I did a week ago and restart from there because what I did was wrong. Now, with regular programming, that's impossible unless you keep creating directories and tag the directories and copy everything. With Git, that's not the case. You can simply say, OK, roll back or undo all the changes and bring the repository back to the state that it was at 2.59 on Wednesday something. So it simply rolls back the whole repository to that thing, undoes everything, and you look at it, and oh, there you go. Now you can continue doing that. Another thing you can do, you can collaborate with Git, which means you can actually put your Git, because uh, Git is essentially is a distributed thing. What does it mean is that um, it creates several intelligent copies everywhere. So what you create what we have right now on GitHub, GitHub is just a big computer. That's all it is. It's just a big computer that holds Git repositories over there. When you clone a repository, as what we call it clone, on your computer over here, you're essentially making an identical copy of that repository on your computer. So the computer on the, the repository on your computer is capable of every single thing GitHub can do. They are literally clones. That's why we call it a clone. Who knows what is the meaning of clone? A duplicate, an identical duplicate of something else, right? Cloning, remember? Anyway, so that's what it is. So when you actually clone a repository, what happens is that, let me just put, put it like this. So. If you just came in, read that thing, please, up there. All right? All right, so what I was saying, yeah. So a clone of the repository is essentially uh, identical to what we have on GitHub. So you can do all the stuff that you're doing on your computer, OK? And then after you're done, you can simply push all the changes up to the master repository, which is, which is on Git. So. By doing this, you're essentially tell to the Git repository what changes I made to my local repository. Therefore, GitHub will clone and essentially have all the changes over here. Therefore, you don't need to carry a memory stick with you anywhere. You just come to school, you clone that repository down your own 
local PC, whatever you are working with, continue your work with it, commit your changes, push everything back to GitHub and delete this. Then go back home and say, I want to pull all the changes. So you pull all the changes from GitHub and put it to your computer. Your computer will take all the updates. That you so essentially, it's a smart copying. Okay, and if it cannot copy two things together, it's going to say, hey, there is a conflict. I tried to merge these two things together, I couldn't. It tells you exactly what a conflict is, and then you're going to look, oh, okay, I know this is this, this is this, you fix those things, and done. So even if it cannot intelligently, if we could say, merge the two changes, it will tell you what's going on. In our case, you're not going to do any of these. For my repository, all you do is pull because you don't have access to push anything into it. I don't want to create chaos. So anything students want to do, or just destroy my repository. So that repository for you is read only, okay? But when you get the student package, you can have your own repository for workshops, whatever you want to do for your schoolwork and everything. And I strongly suggest just for the heck of it, use it and learn how to use with it. Again, the person who knows how to use GitHub and the person who doesn't know how to use, to, to use GitHub is the, is the difference between getting hired and not getting hired. As simple as that. If you know how to use GitHub, you are making at least 10% your chance, chances higher to get picked. Okay? Two reasons. First, they look at your resume. This guy knows GitHub, knows how to do repository, but means the person is doing collaborations. She knows exactly how things work. They're going to hire her. Or they Google your name, and your name immediately comes up. This person has these repositories on GitHub. So if you are creating a GitHub account, make sure you have your real name over there. Over there, you're going to create a username. Cat killer is not a good name, OK? Because it's going to stay with you till the day you die. You don't want the CEO of the IBM have the cat killer user on thing, okay? So don't do that, all right? Okay, cool names are fine, like, I don't know, Prince of Persia. You want to do stuff like this, do it, I don't know. Whatever name that you want to put, that's fine. But cool names, okay. Crazy names, big no-no. Anytime, yeah, you're mature people, anytime you're selecting a name, think that you are 50 years old and somebody's going to use this name and see this name. Is that OK? OK? You don't stay young, trust me. <laughs> and you need to have some kind of a identity. On this. So, and have your real name. Have your real name and a proper avatar uploaded. So when actually somebody comes over, they, they see your face over there. Their name is Farad. I was lucky. My username is actually Farad, because I have a name that not many people have. But so, so you, whatever username that you have, make sure you have your real name over there too, so you can do your stuff properly. Anyway, so that's that. Having said that, let's bring this thing down and start working on it. Okay. Now, to do this, what we need to do, oh, I wish we had the higher resolution. Let me check, check, see if I can actually make the resolution higher on this thing. Um, and I can pause it for it. Nah, forget it. Anyways, um, if you just came in, please do this. And I'm going to reduce this like this. So, it... People at the back, can you see this? It's readable over there. All right, good. So there are two ways to clone with SSH or HTTPS. OK, what is SSH? Anybody knows what is SSH? Anyways, SSH is not a shell. SSH is a protocol. I know so I'm going to open an SSH. Lots of people call a terminal client an SSH. <laughs> an SSH is a protocol with which a terminal client can connect to a server. OK? So SSH essentially means creating a secure, secure connection to GitHub. To do that, you have to have a key installed on your computer. You don't have it over here or you have to carry that key with you on a memory stick. What is a key? Key is a shared secret between you and GitHub. I have it on those videos, and I, and I explain exactly how you create it. You can create a, sh a secure key and put your key on GitHub and another key on your memory stick or installed on your computer, depending on how many different computers you have. You can have so many different keys, or you have one key and carry it around with you, which I do not suggest. 
the best is to create a single key for every computer that you have. Then you put that key on, on GitHub. As soon as you want to do push and pull, GitHub negotiates that key with your computer. If there is a match, then it's going to say, OK, come in. So you don't have to enter user ID and password over and over and over. Okay. If there is a read-only repository, <clears throat> SSH is not needed at all. You can simply use HTTPS. HTTPS, you can do all the stuff you do with SSH using HTTPS. The difference is that with, with HTTPS, every single time you have to enter a user ID and password for GitHub if you are uh, uploading stuff and not only downloading. Uh, if you are accessing private stuff and uh, uh, secure stuff. So if I have an open repository like this to the world, you don't need anything. You're just using HTTPS, you can download it. Or what is a proper name for download? Clone, thank you, you clone it, okay? <clears throat> so clone is actually download, okay? To apply changes is called pulling. Okay, so when you pull a repository, you're saying, give me all the changes. Okay, when you clone, you, so usually clone happens only once. You clone, and then you keep getting the changes. Because you're coming on school computers, you clone, you turn off the computer, everything's gone. So every single time you're cloning. At your computer at home, you are cloning, and after that you simply pull. Okay. If that thing didn't work, and you say, oops, there is a conflict I can't fix. There is a kindergarten way of fixing this. So if you cloned, and then you keep pulling, and it gave you a conflict, and it could not pull anymore, you simply copy that repository aside, put it aside, OK? Clone, and then bring the changes in here and delete the old one, OK? Like this, you don't have to resolve conflicts, because you're not at that stage yet. Remember I told you there is a, when you look over here, I don't know if I told you this or not, but in here I have, I said Git and it's pro Git book. You see this? It's an online open source book, which means you go over here and I told you if you actually read the first two work, first two chapters, you know Git more than me. Okay, it's that simple. Of course, Git is something that no one knows at all. It's a very complicated system. But a good thing is that you can use it as a simple user or as a pro. It does not make any difference. Okay? It's not that because it's very complicated, very big, and very sophisticated, I cannot use it simply. You can use simple users. And so you can go Git, Git on server, keep going branching and stuff like that, distributed thing. And GitHub is the one that is actually tells you how to set up your account on GitHub and all those good stuff, OK? Um, you may hear of the word GitLab, OK? GitLab is essentially GitHub uh, that is branched, OK? So GitLab is another company that's doing exactly what GitHub is doing, but with a different thing. So many people use GitHub. GitLab. We use GitHub since day one when it didn't belong to Microsoft, and we are still using it now that, the Microsoft, that Microsoft bought it. We are still using it. So that's Git. Now let's start. So very first thing you need to do to get that repository is to get in here, click on clone. In our case, use HTTPS. If you are not logged in to GitHub, this clone with SSH will not even show up. Because I am logged into GitHub, I see this. If I'm not logged in the, into GitHub, all you see is clone with HTTPS. And that's what we want to do. So click on clone. So have, make sure it says clone.https over here. And then click over this icon over here to copy it into clipboard. Or you can select it and do copy. Or just click over here. And one, it doesn't give you any message or anything. If you click over here, it goes into clipboard. Then select a directory on your computer somewhere. I strongly suggest on your computer use the directory. I think there is a T, a T, uh, uh, T hard drive on your computer, right? Open up uh, Explorer. Open up Explorer on your computer. Is there a T, T? Yeah, no, it's a temp, D. So temp, that is D. It's a T 
temp directory, put everything in there because that guarantees that when you hopefully, and it doesn't guarantee, sometimes it, does, it doesn't delete as quickly, but at sometimes someone else can log in and see what you have done. But it's a good place to have it not to mess it up. It's very clean, there is nothing else over there. You can put it on desktop too, but there are so many things on desktop that you get lost. So the best thing is to actually put it into the temp drive, that is D. I don't have that D temp drive thingy, so actually I have a drive D, I'm gonna go on drive D, um, and I'm gonna create a directory called temp. So I'm gonna call this temp, okay? So you don't need to do that, you can just go to root of D and then right click and then click on git clone, okay? And then wait for me. So right click, git clone. If you have copied and you did not, you will see the URL already written for you. Click over here on this one. If you have your own computers, please don't get distracted by that. Follow my steps and then we'll go through it, okay? So you click on that, that's perfect. Now go to the Go to the work, go to the directory that you want. Um, drive D, we said, right click, and then select git clone. Okay, so I'll do it again for you to see. All right, again, take a look at this. Take a look at the screen up here, please. Screen up here, please. First thing you do, you go to the repository that you want. You click on this clone and download. Make sure it's cloned with HTTPS over here. You either click over this or right click over here and go copy. Potatoes, potatoes, the same thing. As soon as you copy that, open up the place in which you want to clone the rep rep uh, uh, repository. I asked you to go to drive D temp because it's empty. Right click over there and click on git clone. If you have selected it properly, it automatically fills this with the clipboard URL. So if you see that thing filled in, you're good, <coughs> click on OK. If not, call me. You click on OK, and then you're gonna see this comes up, and it says success. You close it, and if you look at this, now you have an identical copy of what I have on GitHub. Are we good with this? All right, let me pause this. We want to learn how to create a, a project from scratch and start adding files to it and do stuff like that. So um, start the Visual Studio, and I'm going to start mine. Now, well, OK. So let me start my Visual Studio. It's going to be exactly like yours. I'm going to bring it up over here so you can see it. So, whoa, it's too big. So we're gonna go on create a new project. So click on create a new project, okay? And try and find empty project. Where is empty project? Empty project C++ Windows console. Empty project C++ Windows console. It has to be exactly that. Please don't try to deviate and say, okay, I'm gonna do this. It has a, I don't know, a library beside it too, who cares? No, exactly the same, okay? I want it to be exactly the same. So empty project, select that one. When you do this, if you, when, when you're at your computer at home, it adds it to the recent project templates. So you don't have to look for it every single time. And click on next. Okay? After doing this, are we good? All right, after doing this, what I want you to do is to go to the location and select the root of drive D, the temp one. Okay? So root of drive D, I have so many things over there, so I'm gonna go to temp instead, okay? Right beside the repository that you just cloned and click select folder which means your location will be right beside the repository. You're gonna create yours right beside the repository. Then after doing that, make sure that place solution 
and project in the same directory is checked. Okay, it should not be unchecked, it should be checked. For the project name, call it WS00, because it's actually workshop zero, not workshop one. So WS00, I call it. And then click on create. All right? And three years later, it's going to create a repository for you, uh, sorry, um, a project for you, and it's going to come up, don't touch anything, okay? As it comes up, let it be there, okay? If you're working, and at right side of your Visual Studio, take a look, you see over there, Server Explorer, Toolbox, Notifications, Properties, close all of them. At right side, you see there is a tab. All those things, close them all. Close them all. You do this at home, they're going to remain closed. You don't need those stuff. Okay? At left side, right under your Solution Explorer, you have Class View, Property Management, and Team Explorer. Okay? Except from Class View, close everything. So click on the tabs on the bottom. Class view, let it be. The rest close. So the only thing that you need over here is your solution explorer and class view, which you just closed by mistake. If you close your solution explorer, don't worry, we don't have to commit suicide. Just click on view. Click on view. Solution Explorer is the very first one, and it comes back up. So, okay, the, le the less amount of tabs you have open, the less amount of memory you're using. It runs smoothly, so that's what we are going to. Now I want to click on Create. Everybody created their stuff? We are ready? All right, all right, all right. So Create, let's Create. I'm creating, and it's like three years later, it's going to create an empty, uh, empty uh, schmiggly dingy for me. All right. So... Now I'm going to come up over here. So I have Solution Explorer. Let's have that one. Okay. And I don't want notifications. I'm just going to close that. And go back to Solution Explorer. Now, this is extremely important. This is the most important moment of your life. Okay. You need to be able to identify where the directory of your solution is. Lots of people just remotely add files to their solution and that screws everything up right click on the name of the project that is ws00 and click on open click on open folder in visuals in in file explorer right click on ws00 and click on that one that's the directory of your solution. That's where your source files are supposed to be. Now, what you need to do is to copy that cenograph.cpp file from there into here. And if you don't know how to do that, we've got to go back to ULI 101, I guess, or something. <laughs> so go back to the repository that you, you, you cloned and copy that cenograph.cpp in this directory. So I'm going to open in File Explorer. There we go. I'm doing the same thing. So it's opening in File Explorer. Now I'm going to go back one directory, go to the notes, go to 01, right click on cenograph, copy, and go back to my solution directory. Right click and do paste. And now I have cenograph.cpp in here. Anybody needs help doing this? Are we all done? Are we all done? I'm going to pause and... Next thing we want to do is to add a file to our solution. So what we have done right now, it's done. That's it. Okay? Now... Go back to your solution. And another important thing that I wanted to tell you, 
and I want everybody's attention over here. Okay? I want you to create a virtual switch in your brain for me. Okay? Please do that, and it's extremely important for me. A virtual switch in your, for your vocal cords. As soon as you hear me talking, switch your vocal cords to off. Do not speak. Even if you're halfway through an amazing thing happened to you yesterday and you're telling it to your friend, stop immediately. I easily get distracted. It's not your fault. You may be very slowly talking with your friend, but that distracts me. Please, por favor, s'il vous plaît. Please, okay? So, thank you. Now, next thing we need to do is to add this thing. You turn that switch to on. Okay, so right click on source files. That is a CPP file. CPP file is a source file. Right click on the source file, add existing item because it exists. We just copied it over there, right? When you do add existing item, it's going to actually show you the file over there, Senegraph. Click on Senegraph and then click on Add. It should go under Source Files, Virtual Directory over there. The reason I call it Virtual Directory is that the directories in your Solution Explorer do not exist on the hard drive. It is the way Visual Studio organizes things. That file structure is actually inside your VCX proj. You see that over it says WS00 VCX proj? You see that? That one is the place that all these structures are kept. That's why you need to carry those things. Now, if you are, and filters, VCX proj filters, if you are carrying your solution from one computer to another, you want to copy this solution and take it with you to school. You want to put it in a memory stick. Remember, the only thing that you, only things that you need to carry with you are your source files, project VCX proj, and project VCX proj filters. The rest you don't need. You can bring the solution, SLN file, that keeps few things and carries it around. So you can bring the solution. But the most important ones are these two files, VCX Proj filters. The rest do not carry around, especially when you start debugging. It creates a debug directory, and 95,000 files will go in there that just occupy space for no reason. OK? And because of that fact, I actually added a file into my GitHub into my Git repository that I'm going to show it to you. It's called .gitignore. You see that? If you open .gitignore, you will see that inside gitignore, it says Visual Studio, ignore STF, SLN, user, SOU, open yada yada, debug, IBC, HVC, all these things I say ignore. So when I upload something, when I push something into the repository, when I add files to the repository, it ignores all these files. I don't want that crap to go up in GitHub, occupy space, and whenever I want to pull it, it takes half an hour for me because I have three executables over there that is two gigabytes. I don't want that, okay? The only things you need to put up there is, are the things that you need. So understand your Visual Studio and how it works and use it properly. Don't use it blindly. Okay? It's extremely important. So we click on Senegraph, and I'm going to click on Add. Now I have Senegraph under source files, but if I right click on my, pro on my uh, project and open the folder, what I see over there is only Senegraph. There is no source files directory. Again, those are virtual directories, and they are fake. They don't exist, actually. All right? Now, you can either go to build and say build solution, but look at the right side of every and each thing that you see over there. Those shortcut keys make, save you lots of time. Learn those things. If you want to compile, if you want to build, if you want to execute, those are the things that you can do. The rebuild solution recompiles everything even if there is no change. Build solution only builds the things you have modified or the things that are new. So build solution 
is a good thing to do, but if your program is buggy and for some unknown reason, just to play safe, you can rebuild it. If you are working for a real life project, let's say you are developing Chrome, you just downloaded the solution for Chrome on Visual Studio. When I say Chrome, you know what is Chrome, right? The Chrome browser. Okay, if you're downloading that and you want to hack it and see how it works, don't do rebuild every time. It's going to take half an hour. Okay, when you change something, just do build so it only changes the parts that is needed. Okay, so, or you can simply, one of the ways to actually see if things work properly or not is to only compile the thing that you want manually and don't build an executable. I just want to see if things are properly. Turn the switch on, you bad boy. Turn the switch on. All right? So right click over here and go compile. That is control F7. Do it now. If you do that, it only compiles that file and it won't even create an uh, executable. So if, do, if you do this and it's done, it says one succeeded, zero failed, zero, yada, 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 yada. Go to the directory of, the, of Visual Studio and just take a look at the newly created debug directory. If you do that, you will see there is a Cenograph OBJ, Cenograph object. That's the binary compilation of your source file, and it's not yet linked. Therefore, there is no executable. If you want the executable to happen, you have to actually build it, which means compiling the whole thing, which means I have to actually go over here, right click, and go build, which you know is Control Shift B, but when I'm going to say build. And as soon as I build it, it not only compiles that thing, but builds it and links it. And now if I go back over here in debug, I will see an executable is created. So now my program is ready to be tested. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Any questions down here? Okay, I'm gonna pause, come, and then we're gonna continue to the next. Attention! Attention! Achtung! Please! Are we okay? Are we at the same page? Anybody's, anybody needs help? All right. There are two ways Two ways to run using Visual using using Visual Studio using Visual Studio. Number one, to just execute and run as is. Number two, run with soup with Visual Studio supervision, which is in debugging mode. What is debugging mode? In debugging mode, you can stop the execution of the application somewhere in the program and test how it works, and then go through it step by step and debug it and see how things are happening. Okay? Now, all right. So, now that I ran this thing, let me just, uh, and to do that is control F5. So you see it says debug, start without debugging, control F5. So you say if you do control F5, it runs the program without debugging. Try it. Do control F5 and see what happens. Control F5, it runs the program. And you can actually run the program and see how it works. So select one and put, for example, three. So it means you're telling to the program, I have three samples. Now enter two to enter the samples. Put three numbers, I don't know, 40, 20, 44, something like that, whatever. It's enter. Now the samples are entered. Now three to draw a graph of those, so it draws a graph of the samples you entered. Silly program, it's just uh, something to, to test, right? So that's the program that is running. Are we okay with this? Problems? Questions? Suggestions? Okay, we're good. All right, so the next thing I want to see, I want to see 
how the menu is running. Or not the menu. Let's say, I want to see how the samples are entered. Okay? I want to see how the samples are entered. So I'm going to go to main program and just take a look and see how it works. So a main program is essentially a switch and then samples. So get samples is the function that is getting the samples. I can see that, right? I want to see where that function is. Right click on the function name. And click go to declaration or go to definition. Try one of one by one and see what happens. If you say go to definition, it brings you over here. Okay? So it actually shows you where the function is. Are we okay with this? Now I want you to move the file right beside the for loop and bring it right beside line 122 until the, the cursor tilts slightly to left. See? Whoop, it went the other way. You see that? It went the other way. As soon as it does that, click the file out, click the mouse over there, you're going to see a red circle right beside the for loop. Done that? Are we good? After you created that red circle, press F5 only. Yes. You didn't do it. Bring the mouse to the left. Click. F5. Press F5 now. Only F5. And it's going to run the program. But wait, don't do anything. It's going to build and run the program. And the menu is going to show up. Correct? It's going to do something like this. Is that, do we understand this properly? Are we okay? Get, turn your cell phone off first, then drag your window of vi uh, Visual Studio and stick it to the right side of your, as soon as it tags it, let go. Then it tells you which one is on left, select that one. So at left side, you're going to have this. At right side, you're going to have that. Now you can actually bring the, bring the mouse over the side of the thing and adjust the proportion between the two to your liking, whatever you want to do. You see that? If you think the font on your Visual Studio is too big and you want to see more code, hold the control key and scroll the mouse down. That's going to make the code smaller or bigger. Okay, you can do the exact same thing using the percentages over here. I want it to be 70% size. I want it to be 100% size. So you can change it to whatever you want. Are we good down to this point? Have this please set up exactly like that. Have these please set up exactly like that so we can actually debug this together. You just closed it. That's okay though, is it? Oh, you completely closed it? Yeah, because it's... Okay, bad boy you are, but it's okay. All right. Okay, so bring the mouse slowly over here. As soon as it changes directed, direction, click. All right? Are we all good? Do we all have in this red dot over here? That's extremely important. That red dot? You don't have it? Bring the mouse on a for loop. Slowly go to left. No, no, don't, don't, don't do anything extra. Okay, bring mouse on a for loop, on the for loop. Slowly bring your mouse to left. Bring your mouse and slowly bring it to left until the, the cursor tilts. Then you click and it goes up. Now you do it. Do it, do it. Perfect. All right? So you have that red dot thingy over there? All right. Now, click on the execution window, that is your console window, select one, and hit enter. Enter number of samples three, and hit enter, okay? And then hit two for enter samples, and hit enter. See what happened. 
it stops, and as you see, a yellow arrow appears on that little red, red, uh, red thingy over there. That means execution has been paused. Now execution is at that line. You cannot actually enter anything on the window now because it is actually paused. Are we okay with this? I want you to do this. Now, I want everybody to see that yellow arrow on the red circle right now. You all have it? What are you doing, my friend? If you don't want it to do like this, it's going to disappear. And then you can bring it back up. Um, OK, so you're good. All right, now, I want you to click on Visual Studio to activate its window. window. Click on Visual Studio to activate its window. OK? Now, I want you to click on debug and take a look. These three things. Don't select it, just look. It's the most important thing in a lab to do what I say and nothing extra, because I want to make a point. Those three things that you see are your friends, F11, F10, and Shift F11. Remember these three keys, F11, F10, and Shift F11. These are walkthrough keys. It walks the code through for you. OK? Now, remember, F10, F11, and Shift F11. F11 means step into. What does it mean? If you are right at the edge of a function and you press F11, it's not going to execute the whole function. It actually goes into the function and debug the function for you if you want and walk through the function for you. If you know that function works perfectly and you don't want to walk through it, you just want to go to the next step, you press F10. It executes the whole function and goes to the next line. If, now I want your attention, if by mistake you press F11 and you go to this big function and you say, damn, I didn't want to come in here. You can press Shift-11. It means execute this function, get out and wait. That's Shift-F11 that is step out. So step in, steps into a function and walks through for you. F10 walks over a function and executes the whole function and passes it. If by mistake you go to a function or you are in a function and everything is set and done properly, you want to get out, you do Shift-11 and comes out. Now. Next thing, close that thingy. Bring your mouse on variable i and take a look at it. It tells you what is the content of the variable. Minus, I'll give you 20 bucks if you can read that number. <laughs> but, but anyways, it's some garbage in there. OK? And now everybody wants the 20 bucks. <laughs> OK, now what I want you to do, what I want you to do there is no function in here, right? Because there is no function, F11 and F10 are the same. So press F10 for me once, only once, one hit on F10. You do that, and you see it goes in into the line function. You see that? Now bring your mouse over the I, and you'll see I is zero now. So it shows you the content. Press F10 again, not F11. F10. And you see the whole function for line is executed. The line is drawn, and it goes to the next one. You see that? Press F10 again. It shows you the first line. Press F11 now. It's not going to run go back, but it goes in go back. Oops, I didn't want to come in here. Hold Shift and press F11. It goes out of go back and goes back in there. OK? Now press F10 again to go on samples. Press F10 again. The control from Visual Studio redirects to the console, because now it wants to read something from the console. You see that? Now put over there 20 and hit Enter. It goes back to Visual Studio. You see that? 
Bring your mouse on samples, and now you will see if you click on that, oh, actually, it's not going to show you anything because it's not an array, it's a pointer. But anyways, if you select the whole thing with I and everything and bring your mouse over it, then it shows you the content of samples I is 20. If you want to know what is the index, don't highlight it and just only put, your I, put it on the I. Press F10 again. It goes back to the for loop, come down, hold the mouse on I, and you will see now it's 1. As you see, it's walking through the code for you, step by step, showing you what is the execution, what are the variable contents, and how everything is going. This is what you're going to do all year, all, not all year, the rest of your life, over and over and over to debug codes that have problem, okay? Now, if everything is good and fine and dandy and everything's good, I don't want to do any more walkthrough, uncheck that red thingy. Bring your mouse over it and click, and it's going to be gone. If you press F5, it's going to execute right to the end. But there's a problem. Don't press F5. There's a problem. If you press F5, because it's in debugging mode, it's not going to hold the window open at the end. If you want, after the program is done, to window to remain over there for you to see, scroll down to the main, go to the last line of the main, and put a stop sign. Remember, this is not control F5, this is F5. This is not run without debugging, it's run with debugging. So if you don't ask it to keep the window open, when execution is over, the window closes and you can't see anything. So put a dot right beside the end of the main, and now you can press F5. Now it actually runs the whole thing. Now I can put over here 350 and hit enter. Now I can go three graphs. I look at my graphs, whatever is created. Exit will go out, and it will stop right at the last line of the program. The program is not finished yet. I know there is an urge now that is complete to close the window. Don't. If you successfully close it like this, you're going to crash your Visual Studio because Visual Studio is debugging your code that you just closed. If Visual Studio is smart enough not to let you close, then you'll understand. But it was a bug before. You could have closed and your Visual Studio would have crashed. There is a stop sign up here. You see that? Or you can go to debug and click on stop debugging. That is shift F5. And that stops the debugging and ends the execution. And you're done. Because you didn't finish it. You were supposed to actually finish the execution. So you've got to go zero, finish it, and now. So you have to first finish, and now you can actually stop. And it stops, OK? All right, so that was debugging. We have done the debugging. Life is beautiful, and everything's done. And if you're looking for a break, we're not going to have one because we don't have time. OK, sorry. OK, next thing, because <clears throat> I see people are going, oh, I want to go out. No, you can't. We have to finish this first. We're going we're gonna to only create one header file and continue, and the rest you can try at home. And when I put the workshop up, this is exactly what, you, what you're supposed to do with your workshop. So I'll give you a file, and I'm going to say, go modularize it. So what happens is that, and I'm not going to tell you which function goes where, not anymore. I'm just going to tell you, I need these three modules, and this is what your main's going to look like. Go do it. It's your choice to select which function goes in which module. Use your own judgment. OK? I'm not going to tell you what is what. It's your choice. Anyways, <clears throat> so let's uh, close everything and maximize the window so we can actually see what we are doing. All right? First thing first. Let's say, let's say I want to Look at the functions that I have in here. And as you see, none of my functions over here 
Uh, let me remove that dot over there because I don't want it to stop and I don't want it to. But anyways, I'm going to come up over here and take a look. And you'll see when I take a look at this, there are no prototypes for my functions. Why? Because I put all the functions above the main. Each function that is using another function, the other function is at the top so everybody is seeing what is necessary. When you are modularizing stuff, that's not going to happen. Every single file of module of yours must have a header file, and that header file should contain all the prototypes for the functions the module holds. So the first module we are going to create over here, I'm going to call it utils for utilities. One thing I have to tell you, you are writing a portable code. Make sure to use the capitalization for your files exactly as it's instructed. Because if you put something lowercase and uppercase on Windows, Windows doesn't care. It's not a case sensitive operating system. But when you move it to matrix, it's not going to recognize it if the case doesn't match exactly. And changing a case sensitive, changing the case of a file name in Windows is tricky. On Windows, if you have utils with lowercase u and we want to make it uppercase, first you have to rename util to something different, then utils to uppercase to do it. Because if you just change the U to uppercase, Windows doesn't recognize that anything has changed. Because uppercase and lowercase doesn't work. If you want to do that, you have to first rename it to something different, like add an underline or something, then capitalize it and change it back to what he wanted to do. Anyway, so I'll show it to you. So what we want to do now to add a module. First, we want to listen to Farad carefully, OK? Because I see you're talking. Switch off. Hey. All right. Number two, we want to add two new items to our solution. Item number one in header files, because I want to create a utils module, it's going to be utils.h with capital U. Right click on header files, add new item. Right click on header file, add new item. If you are trying to take note quickly and stuff like that, I'm recording it. I'm going to put it up just later on. Go look at the video and do the notes if you want to. OK? But anyways, so new item. You click on new item. Select header file. OK? Oh, sorry. Visual. If you don't have the things, I only installed the Visual C++ feature because I don't want to clutter this computer with anything else. Yours probably have all the languages known to man, OK? If that's the case, go to Visual C++, click on code, and then header file, and then over here, write utils.h with capital U, utils.h, and click on add. Let me know if there is any trouble. That was quick. Then you see at the top it says Pragma once. Delete it. If you see at the top of the file it says Pragma once, delete it. Or you can let it be and add something after. It doesn't matter. All right? That thing I do not like because it's not portable. It doesn't work on previous versions of C++, and we want to write as portable code as possible. So after you added utils.h, all right, either remove that pragma once, and if you didn't, go, just go to next file, next line, OK? What you need to do over here is this, and this is standard. This is what we are going to do at, IP, at OP244. So what we are going to do is this. We're going to write over here. So you write hashtag if not defined. So if NDF, then you write a unique name using the name of the function. So you write SDDS capital underline utils all capital underline H and two underlines afterward and hit the enter. So if the name of the header file was hehaw.h, then it would have been stds underline hehaw underline h underline underline. So, because believe it or not, I had students that added utils.h for all their header files. <laughs> okay, so I just want to make sure that you understand. That is made up of the name of the file. 
if not defined. And then you write another line, define. Do not retype that. Don't trust yourself because you're going to make a spelling mistake and that's going to cause a bad bug. Copy that piece and paste it down and hit enter. And then hashtag and if. And save it. Control S, save it, saves it. You have just created an empty header file. Whenever you create a header file, this is what you do with your eyes closed. This is an empty header file. We do not have an empty header file with no code in it, and it's impossible. An empty header file is this, with these statements in it. Now you open it up. Now we can actually write things if we want in it, which we can't because we don't have the module for it. We have the header file, but not the CPP file. Now go to the source files, right click on the source files, add new item. This time select CPP file and type utils.cpp. In utils.cpp, you include utils.h with double quotes. Now, one more thing that I forgot to say, and it only applies, and it only applies to Seneca College. Like what you're doing right now, you see SDSUTs.H. When you're hired in a company, you have to ask what is the regulation for that. Not to ask, like when you start coding, they're going to give you a 500 page manual of the regulations of coding in that company. And if you don't follow one dot out of that one, your code's going to be rejected and it's not going to be merged into upstream. So, Every single thing that you're said, you have to follow to the point. There is no joke about this. If you write the code that is going to solve human hunger, they're not going to accept it if you have an underline missing. I'm telling you. It's like that important, okay? So you have to follow the rules. Another rule that we are doing, every code that we are writing at Seneca College is under the namespace SDDS. What is a namespace? We don't care at this point. Just closely, close your eyes and follow the regulations, okay? So what you do, you create a namespace. So you write namespace, SDDS, open curly bracket, close curly bracket. Essentially, every code that you write will be in a namespace SDDS. That's what is it, it is, okay? Every code that you write is in SDDS except the code you write in main. Remember, the main module that uses everything, that is not going to be in namespace SDDS. That uses the name, namespace SDDS. I'm not going to tell you what a namespace is. First, look how it's implemented, then I'll explain what it is. So. If I'm writing this in namespace SDDS, I'm going to do the exact same thing in my utils.cpp. So I'm going to write over here namespace SDDS. Now, what is a namespace? Namespace essentially is a place you put your names in. <laughs> namespace is a space for your names. But let's, apart from that, namespace is a place you put your code. Okay? Now, Unlike other things in programming languages that you have, that when you created something new, you, can, you could not give it a new name because there was a conflict, namespaces are like two bubbles coming together and suddenly merge and making a big, bigger bubble. So if you have namespaces with the same name, they just merge and they become a bigger namespace. There is no conflict. Essentially, namespace SDDS in utils.cpp is the same as utils.h, which means all the code in your compilation will be in the same namespace. Why do we do that? There is a lot that you can write and use in your code. There could be many departments that do things in different ways. 
if I think about programming, programming essentially means that you look at something and you try to bring its application into the computer. That's what programming is, right? Now, depending on who wants to use that, you write a different code. If I want to have a car to be painted in a paint shop, I have to write a different code for that application, or if I want to have a car to be sold in a dealership, they are both cars. One needs to get painted, the other one needs to get sold. So the application written for these two are completely different things, right? This is called abstraction. When you look at something and you do what you need to do about that particular thing, that's called abstraction. Now, because you can have many different aspects of the same thing, for them not to get conflicted, you put them in their namespace. So if I wanted to actually code that car thingy, the car that is supposed to get implemented to get painted will be in namespace paint shop, where the car that is going to get implemented to be sold will be in namespace dealership. We are in the school of SDDS, so our, all our code will be in namespace SDDS. So if anywhere else in C++, any name is similar with ours, there's not going to be a conflict. That's what namespaces are essentially for. Now, we can actually start writing stuff in our, in our, uh, uh, oh, by the way, C++ did not have namespaces, okay? Recently, they added namespaces to it to be able to manage the names. Then they said, okay, what are we going to do with all the old stuff that we had, all the standard stuff that we had in C++? We need to put them in a namespace. So they put all the standard stuff of C++ in a namespace called STD, standing for standard. And anywhere you want to use that namespace, you have to say using namespace STD. That's why at the top of all C++ programs, you see it, something is included and it says using namespace STD. Okay? You are not implementing. You are never going to write namespace STD open curly bracket. It is already implemented by C++ developers, by developers who built C++. Okay? Now, let's go into Cenegraph, okay? Let's get the functions that are utility functions. So if I look at top, get int is a good candidate. So I'm just going to just cut the get int function, literally cut, and paste it in utils.cpp. Okay? One good thing you can do one thing that is a good practice that I always do is this. You don't know, you know what cut and paste is? Come on, you know that, right? Cut the code from Cenegraph and paste it in utils.cpp inside that namespace. Okay? I know you're going to have error messages. Don't worry about it. We're going to take care of all those. Are we okay down to here? Are we okay down to here? We were supposed to have a quiz on polymorphism, inheritance, and encapsulation today. Remember that? I didn't do it. We don't have time. But, but you remember what it was. We essentially had objects, and objects were supposed to imitate real-life stuff and so on and so forth, right? Now, we're going to go to it soon, and we're going to use it soon, okay? So <clears throat> now, what we need to do is to get the prototype of this function and put it in utils.h. So only copy the name of the function, copy the name of the function, only the name of the function, and paste it in utils.h, and put a semicolon at the end. Okay? Now, it's a good practice to do what I'm doing now, to be able to code properly, do modular coding. When you have modules, you have header files, you have CPP files, right? Go to window, 
and select new vertical tab group. Go to window and select new vertical tab group. When you do that, new vertical tab group, you're going to have two different tabs. So you can actually have the CPP at left, the header file at right, so you can see what you're doing right in front of you. Now, something important about prototype of the functions that I don't think you've been taught that. The names of the variables are formality. I could just remove this, right? Never do that, ever, ever. Because it makes the header files, makes the prototype of the function vague. I am saying get int, int, int. What the heck is that? What is the first int? What is the last int? Not only not remove it, but also add and make it understandable. So if it's, I'm going to say minimum number acceptable. Maximum number acceptable. It is a formality and it's going to be completely ignored. I better make a use of it. I better make it in a way so if somebody looks at my header file, knows how the damn function works, instead of giving some vague thing over there. So make sure, not, don't imitate me writing exactly min number accessible. Write whatever you feel is right, OK? Write what you think. If seven years from now you look at that function's prototype, you yourself can understand what the heck happened, OK? I don't usually put number, I put NO because it's shorter. So I, do, I go min, NO, I'm still a C programmer, we don't like COBOL-like names, we like small names, little cute these thingy, but anyways. So something like that, whatever you want. It gets ignored anyway, okay? Now we're gonna come to lutils.h. Now in here, we're gonna see there are a few things in here that are not known. Those are called C in and C out. Input and output in C++ language is not done the way C language did it. They are done using two objects. One object is responsible to represent input. That is called console input, C in. The other one is representing output. That is console output. These functions all four, these two objects are fully object oriented, which means unlike C language, you don't need to tell it what to print and how to print. Of, of course, you can format it, but in C language, if you want to print an integer, you have to tell to print f is a percent d. If you are printing a float, you have to say it's a percent f. Reading and writing from this is completely polymorphic. And polymorphism was many shapes. It means it has many shapes. You see over there, I have C in and extraction operator. I'm extracting from console and putting it in val. What is the type of val? It's an integer. So it knows it's supposed to read an integer. You don't have to tell it. If I want to read a name, I simply create a string and I go C in and I put the name of the string. It's a string, it's polymorphic, it knows how to read it. Same thing with C out. C out, I have insertion operator, inserts that string into C out that is console. Now all these things are in a header file called IO stream. So what you need to do, you need to include that I.O. stream right up there so it knows where it is. So I'm going to say include I.O. stream. But as you see, there is no dot .h after that. C++ uses namespace. It doesn't need the dot .h after that. So you simply say, I want to include I.O. stream. But... As we already mentioned, everything that is old in C++ from standard stuff are in a namespace called STD. Therefore, underneath IO stream, I have to say using in this file, 
I am using the namespace STD. And voila, now I have my function create added to the module utils.h and life is beautiful. Are we okay down to here? I'm going to answer your question in two seconds. Are we okay down to here? Oh, so anything, and as you see, you never, ever include anything in a header file unless you need it there. The main rule of including files, you include files only where they need it. Never, ever indirectly include something. I'm going to say I'm going to include it in utils.h because utils.h is included in CP, utils.cpp. Therefore, no, don't do that. You see something is needed, the include is going to go there. Don't put it someplace remote because through a uh, transitive thing it's going to come because this is included there and that is included and this is included and that. So it's going to, don't do that. Always see where it's needed and add it there. Yes. Always, always put the C library, the, the C++ libraries first, then your custom libraries. Put it after the last, if, you ha if I have, include C stream, in include IO stream, include this, include that, include, I uh, have all those things, then using namespace std right after the last one. Okay, all right? Now, we are, so I removed that get int from my graph.cpp, right? Now it needs to use it. So in here I have to say include utils.h. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Utils.h is implementing what namespace? SDDS namespace, right? So my main is using it. Therefore, in here, because the main program application of mine is an application that is using my namespace, in here I have to say using namespace SDDS. And now I'm good to go. I can actually compile this, and my first function in my utility will work perfectly with absolutely no problem. And if there is any problem, we'll fix it, which is not it, so it actually runs, so it's beautiful. Okay? Now, the rest of this, you don't need to do it with me. A, a question that I have, down to this place, did we understand what just happened? Okay, now if you can follow me, I'm going to quickly add other stuff to the utils.h and make it better, okay? So if you can keep up with me, fine. If not, go home, you have it, continue it at home, okay? But I just, because I have only 10 minutes, I just want to show what happened as a, as a big picture. So we go through it, um, and, and then we're going to see what happens. So uh, always remember, uh, do, anybody knows what these things are doing actually? what these two lines are doing? It prevents duplication, but how? Let me just tell you what's going on. First of all, when you are writing C or C++, you are writing two languages at the same time. One language is the language that we like, we use, we call it C or C++. The second language is the compiler language pre-directives, pre-compilation language that you're putting, anything that starts with a hashtag. Anything that starts with hashtag, you're actually telling to compiler how to compile your code. So that program runs before your compilation. And that program only runs when you are compiling the code. When executable is built, all those things are gone. How did I do it? What, what does it do? It tells to the compiler, if that token, if that statement is not defined, continue compiling. So compiler continues the compilation. What is at line three? It actually defines it, right? And it keeps going. So if by mistake or by logic, I have this included twice, what's gonna happen? 
The second time utils.h is being included, it comes up, compiler, at line two, it says, if not defined SDDS utils, is it not defined? No, it was just defined two seconds ago, right? Therefore, everything between that if statement will be skipped. So multiple inclusions will not create conflict. That's why we call it compilation safeguards. Pragma 1 supposedly is supposed to do that. But I had bad experience with it, especially when you're porting your, your application from computer to computer and compiler to compiler. Sometimes that didn't work for me. I have no idea why. So if you actually go to the libraries of C++, you'll see they have them both. <laughs> OK? So the second one is absolutely safe, and it runs everywhere. So you can just remove Pragma once and use this one. OK? You can just do that. But if you have the Pragma once over there, eh, it doesn't make any difference. Potatoes, potatoes. OK? Uh, I just leave it over there just for the heck of it. Now, if I want to see how do I add the rest of the stuff, I'm going to say, OK, go back. I need go back. I'm going to take the go back out, put it right in here. And I'm going to paste the other one over here, remove it, and just go. And oh, sorry, I'm going to put like that. And in here, I'm going to say go back n characters. So it actually goes back n characters. OK. So that's that one. Go back is there. I forgot to bring its. Comment, so I'm going to put the comment here and comment here. And I didn't put that comment over there. So these things, lots of students, by mistake, do these at the end of their coding when they want to actually submit the code. That's what they do. That's what they do. It's the biggest, silliest mistake you can make. I didn't want to say stupid because it, was, it wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't what they call it these days. Uh, I don't know. It's not, properly, it's not proper to say it's stupid. It is silly. You know why it's silly? Because that's for you to organize your thought and not get lost in your code. Believe me, I'm not going to get lost in your code. It's you that is getting lost. So all those comments that you add at the end, it's just funny. You're supposed to do it while you're coding. So you remember what you're, what you're doing. If you're doing it right before you want to give, give it to me to get a few marks, that's just silly. OK? So have those comments always added as you are going through your coding. Believe me, especially this semester and semesters later, where we give you a complicated project to do, and it takes taking you two months to do it. A month after you developed a function, you forget how it worked. You did it a month ago. Writing a comment what that function does really helps you and speeds things up. And it helps me to mark your code properly, too. So I'm just going to give you a few more marks if you do that. If you don't do it, I'll be really pissed. <laughs> OK? So next thing. So I have the get instant that center graph. I'm going to go over here. Line. Line is not a utility thing. Or maybe it is. OK, draw a line. I'll put it over there. That's one of the utilities. Could be something. So in here, I'm going to put the prototype for it. That is only the name. And in here, I'm going to say n characters long. OK, is that the one? Oh, that's on. <laughs> Thank you. See, that's how easily you can make a mistake. So draw. See, in here, I'm going to say draw a line n characters long. And now in here, I can add exploration label or null PTR if no label is needed. <laughs> OK? So now we know what those null PDRs are. So if you want to put a label for that thing, you put something in there. Otherwise, you can just make it null. We'll We'll, we'll learn what the fault arguments are the next week you're coming in, and, and everything's going to go crystal clear. So that's that. So I have the line. 
created. Uh, samples first, that has nothing to do with utils. Menu is a menu. Print bar, that's with the report. Find max, that's finding maximum. Print graph, get samples. May so I think that's it. So um, I don't want to add anything more. That's my utils. Now, if I want to add something else, it's possible that I want to. So center graph is actually the graph that is being made. So in here, I'm going to say add new item. And I'm going to create a new item. I'm going to say center graph app.cpp. So my main will actually go in there. So this one, I'm going to say include uh, utils.h. OK, and I'm going to put the main in here, control S. I'm going to write it later on. And my center graph actually becomes the place that has the logic for the graph. So I'm going to use that one, that name, and create a header file exactly with that. So I'm going to say add new item, centergraph.h, add. And add the things that I want. So if not defined, SDDS, center graph, underline H, underline, underline. And I'm going to say over here and uh, um, define and copy that one over here. And go and diff. And I'm going to bring this to right because it's a header file. Save everything. Now I can put everything that is related to Senegraph in here. So menu is my, my main application. It's not going to go there. Samples first, it's not going to go there. Bar is the graph. Find max is the graph. Print graph. Get samples. Main, I don't want to. I'm going to take those things over here and put it in Senegraph. And I'll make sure I have the IO stream and manip over here. That's to, manip is to manipulate the output, which means format it. So I'm going to put that thing at the top. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. My apologies. I put it in a header file. I put it in a header file. I was a bad person. I was a bad person. I put it in a header file. Let me just, let me just copy it over here, Control V, and take everything out. My apologies. I put it in a header file. That's not a place I want to put it in. Uh, X. I'm going to go back in here and put it in here. There we go. And everything has to be in a namespace. So a namespace SDDS. SDDS. And I'm going to go and add it over here. And I'm going to put the uh, prototypes over here. So as you see, I'm just organizing my code. There is nothing is being written, actually. So let's do it over here. So this get samples. I just need a semicolon over here. That's that. Uh, a semicolon over here. A semicolon over here. A semicolon over here. And a semicolon over here. And there you go. I have all the prototypes in there. And they're going to be in the namespace. Uh, namespace. SDDS. Save it. Inside here, I'm going to include. Senegraph, save it. Now I have graph width. Graph width appears to be something that is uh, essentially part of graph design. So I'm going to put those in a header file too. X, it's going to come into the header file <clears throat> and add it over here. <clears throat> and that's a namespace, not namespacer. 
Anyways, so I'll continue doing that. And at the end, what I'm going to have in this main, in here I have to include Senograph, and it almost, it almost becomes like, uh, I have to go through it and see actually what is what, and make sure everything's working. So it becomes a modular program, which is essentially have Senograph application, Senograph logic by itself, and the utils, and I compile it, and I have an organized code. And that's how to, how you compile, how to convert to uh, 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 a sloppy program is written in one, one file, into modules. No one ever creates a program in one file. Whenever you are creating something, you have to think modules. You always need utils. So in all my programs, I have utils.h and utils.cpp, things that I, my tools are there, things that apply to everything. And I usually bring it from one program to another. I just copy my old utils.cpp and ch to my new program and I use it. That's how you reuse your code. That's how you use your modules. So you get used to do this, and you are going to be fine. And I'm going to stop the thing, the, the workshop.